Okay, good afternoon. My name is German Eichberger. I'm with Rackspace, and we are here to talk about load balancing. That's basically the, our introduction class, the, the 101. Tomorrow we have more advanced things going on. Also, in case you are here for the lunch, that's not a lunch here. It's, it's open, it's load balancing. Here's my dear colleague. Oh, yeah, um, I'm Adam Harwell. Uh, I'm with GoDaddy. I'm going to be helping German out with this talk today, and I just have to remember to face the mic. And as on the slides, you find uh, Michael Johnson. That's our uh, project uh, technical lead. He couldn't be here today. He would love to be here, and he wanted us to video him in, but we said no. <laughs> we'll do it all by ourselves. Okay, so then let's get started. What are we going to talk today? I want to talk about what is load balancing at all? What are some of the use cases for load balancing? I want to talk about how we do that in OpenStack. And we talk about how you can do it in the back end, what providers we have. Talk a little about how you can set them up. We have an API, we have a CLI, we have a graphical user interface, and then a bunch of other things you might not be familiar with, like session persistence, TLS termination, and L7 or layer 7, L7 load balancing. And so let's start off for people not familiar with load balancing. What is it all about? So let's imagine we have a user who wants to get to OpenStack.org. He sends a request. It gets sent by the load balancer to a server. Server returns it. And then he gets his website. Now we have a second user who sends his request. And he goes to another server and being sent back to the user. So they both use the same DNS address, which went probably to the same IP address, but then was serviced by two different servers. And that's what a load balancer does. It basically balances the load of incoming web traffic between uh, however many servers you want to put there. So there are four here, but in production environments, people have hundreds. So, so yeah. So this is that. So basically, and then what are some use cases for the load balancers? As I said, the first one is you want to distribute a network load between many servers. So a lot of requests coming in and then it's being distributed between many servers. It also want to increase the availability. So a, a load balancer usually checks the, what we call the backend servers. And if one of them is not responsive, then it will take them out of rotation. Out of rotation means that subsequent requests by users don't get sent to this server until it's been repaired and be available again. And so users don't see downtime because if you just do it that way and you always hit this broken down server, users keep getting their 500s or whatever. So it also increases the availability because now you can have servers coming down and everything still works. Uh, we will talk later about SSL offload and centralized certificate management. So that's a little bit about that. Another use case a lot of people have is protocol protocol conversion. Some people might want to advertise the services as IPv6, but still under data center IPv4. So load balancer can take IPv6 traffic and convert it to IPv4. Or the other way around, they are really modern data center, everything IPv6, but they still want to have an IPv4 address where people can come to them and then the load balancer can then translate IPv4 requests into IPv6. So it's very common because then L7 policies, we have an extra slide on that where we go more into details. Uh, just an example right now is, so static image files might be on, a, on different servers. Then you have your application server. Those servers might have caches and things, but you still want them on the same address. So still when you say openstat.org slash images, you don't want to say images.openstat.org, you want to do it that way. And then the, and then the load balancer can redirect that to specific image servers and the application things to specific application servers. Another thing load balancers can do for you, they can abstract the physical network topology. So basically all what people, all what your users see is the address of the load balancer. They don't really see how it looks behind it. And, and, and that basically allows you to do upgrades. So you can keep adding new um, application servers, you service in the back end without anybody noticing, can take old ones out, 
and you can move things around as you see fit without changing anything and keeping all your services up. Yeah, there's actually a neat trick you can do with this. Um, I don't know if you have tried this, but if you're introducing a new version of your software, for example, you can actually just throw one node into your pool with the new version. That way, like every 10th or 15th request hits that, or you can wait it to be even lower. Um, watch what's happening with that, and if you notice that something's going wrong, you can easily just pull that right back out of rotation. Um, but if it looks good, you can roll all the rest of your nodes in. That way, you know, really minimize the impact of a possible bad upgrade. So yeah. we use that trick sometimes. It mm -hmm. works pretty well. Yeah, it's the same with A-B testing if you want to do that. Just throw stuff in and see how people react. Okay, so that's the OpenStack model, how we kind of broke that down. So at the top of the things, we have a load balancer, which basically this object uh, keeps the VIP, the, the virtual I, the, the IP under which you can access a load balancer. And this is, is our top level project. So you can only have one of those IPs associated with load balancer. So to kind of um, think about it, so the load balancer object holds the IP address of your service. Then we have listeners, and they do the port. So like if you have an HTTP traffic, you put in a HTTP listener at port 80. You might have a HTTPS there too, then you put in a listener at port 443. So basically listeners, they specify the ports under which the system should listen on this IP we specified on the load balancer. Now they listen, now with that end, they are listening to something, requests come in, they need to do something with them, and they basically forward them to what we call a pool. A pool is a collection of members. With members we mean backend servers, which basically then do the, do the application or serve the website or whatever needs to be served, and we, we kind of put them together in a pool. And as you can see, you can use the same pool, for instance, for two different listeners in the same load balancer. The other thing we have is a health monitor, so you can specify how the pool checks the health. I said that when a server goes down, when it isn't responsive, we take it out of rotation. And a health monitor allows you to specify exactly when we decide on that. So, so there's, for instance, it could be as simple as just hitting the, the HTTP page, and if it's a 200, we are, we are keeping it. Or it could be going to a different port, doing internal things, whatever, to decide that this member's unhealthy. The other thing, which is you could have the same server, uh, the same server as a member twice, if you have a if your web server listening on different ports. It's very common if you run something like Kubernetes, where they put all those pods on very esoteric ports, and so you can then add each of those ports as a, as a member, even if it's on the same IP in your backend, and the computer will load balance that for you. Okay. The other thing, um, so, so we have talked about the model. The other thing I want to talk about is how, how it does actually happen in real life, in OpenStack, how does the load balancing work? So when you create a load balancer, you can specify a provider, and that will basically implement, will do the work of load balancing. And the providers available are our Octavia reference implementation. So, so what we are working on is, is Octavia, that's the open source, open stack, load balancer, it's operator grade and everything. But there are also hardware vendors who sell load balancers, and they have written drivers for our load balancing system. They are A10, Brocade, Citrix, Netscaler, F5 Networks, Camp Technologies, Redware, and also VMware, NSX. So if you happen to have something like that in your basement, you can continue using that with OpenStack. Another thing we have is a legacy HA proxy namespace driver, which we have planning on sort of deprecating because it's not really scalable, highly available, and whatever. And so we don't really want to have that out there because people usually use load balancers to get their services highly available, highly scalable. And, and if you have a load balancer which can't do that, that defeats the purpose of load balancing. Okay, so how can we set up things on our load balancer? Well, we have an application programming interface, so it's all, like everything in OpenStack, it's all microservices, REST-based, and so on, so are we. So we have a REST interface, we can basically send some JSON to, which specifies a load balancer, and you see in the middle of the slide, see how it says, 
load balancer, right? that does a load balancer, you can give a description, you have to give it a subnet where you want the VIP be on, so, and can give it the address or not. If you don't give it the address, it will allocate one itself, but if you want to give it to that, that's good. You can give it a provider, like in this case, we are asking for an Octavia load balancer, and we always like to give Octavia load balancers the name best load balancer, because we like them the most. I'm talking about uh, the subnet and, and those things. So our load balancers, they so in OpenSec, you can have subnets. Some, pe some people have public subnets, some people have private subnets. So you can put a load balancer, for instance, on a private subnet, it gets an IP, and then it would load balance under this IP. Maybe you want to expose it to the public, you can then put a floating IP on it. Other people have public subnets, you can put it on there. You can keep your members still on some private subnet, on some private tenant network, and, and add them to it. And the load balancer is basically in the middle between your public subnet and your private subnet and has uh, ports in both. So you can be very flexible with that technology and a lot of, and there are some people who have provider networks for their public subnets, so they have more performance, we support that too. So it's really what works for you. Maybe you don't want to even expose it to the public and just have it to load balance, uh, databases, uh, whatever you want to do. So there's all kinds of possibilities. The other thing, uh, our API supports is a single call grade, so, so you can create everything, pools, listeners, members, whatever you want in one call to make that much, much quicker if you need to set up them in a hurry. The other way we do things is our load balancing command line interface, like everything in OpenStack, we also have a CLI tool, and, and we are we are having a Python Octavia client, which will be coming in in Pike. Right now, we are still on the Neutron client, so if you're in a pre-Pike release like Okada or even earlier, you would have to use the Neutron client, but the commands are almost the same. And you can also create a load balancer with the command line, so it's again the name best load balancer. And this time, we don't give a VIP address, we just give the subnet, and I said in that case, the load balancer will, we will allocate an IP for you based on the DHCP system uh, you might have in Neutron. And then, and then when you run this command, it will return to you some, some statistics, what's happening, operating, so each load balancer starts with an operating system, stat, operating status offline, because it takes some time to build it and provision it. And you see the provision status pending create, and then, after some time, it will switch to active. One thing to keep in mind, if a load balancer is in a pending create, pending update status, then you can't do any changes to it. So if you then would try, say, okay, I want to change the name, I want to add a listener, then we'll get back. You can't do that until it's in an active state again. That's just uh, for us to keep things sequenced and make things more logical, because otherwise you're skewing up stuff and yeah, gets, gets messy. Okay, and we also have a Horizon dashboard, and my colleague will show you more about that. All right, <clears throat> so uh, we've actually, a note about this, um, I know in the past we've had some questions about uh, our dashboard uh, because there was a, I think we missed releasing a version. There haven't actually been any changes to it since what, uh, maybe Newton? Yeah, I think I think Newton was the last actual change we had to the dashboard because the API has been stable since then. Um, so I think if you're if you notice that there's a version missing, just install the version before that, and it's the same thing. Um, uh, we, we started doing releases, so so, so yeah, we started I, doing so basically people got confused, and so we started yeah, releasing we, things, but it didn't change the code. Yeah, we've <laughs> we've done releases since then. Um, we hope to have some a few changes about, uh, around this uh, in the next maybe Queen's release, uh, but for now what you should see in Pike should be what we're showing you today. So um, just going to walk through really quickly creating a very basic load balancer. Um, so this UI is made to c capture the 95% use case. Um, there's some stuff that you'll notice here, maybe if you've used our API that's, that's missing, um, but the API will let you do a lot more complex stuff. So uh, just, uh, let, let me interject. Yeah, I'll, I'll so let me check. When we designed the user experience for this UI, what we had in mind was that somebody who has no idea about load balancers 
can get one very, very quickly. So when they go through that, we'll, everything will be pre-populated. It will be very easy for people to get a load balance. Of course, we had them to cut down on complexity. So, but people get, if they have no idea, they get to one very quickly. So that's our goal. Yeah, and I'll have, I have some more notes about that that uh, I can explain after this. So just uh, walking through creating a very simple load balancer here. Um, so you would just go to the load, the load balancer section of the UI, click create load balancer. Um, we'll get a load balancer description up here. We'll put something in uh, Octavia. Uh, yeah, Octavia rocks. Uh, we'll select our subnet. Uh, we're going to go ahead and put this one on the private subnet and go to the next screen. So now we would define our listener. So like I said, this is where we say what port and protocol we're actually listening for. Um, so in this case, we're just going to do HTTP 80, uh, pretty standard. Um, we're going to make a pool. Uh, round robin's probably good enough for us for this demo. Uh, so we'll go ahead and define some members. Um, here we'll just pull in a couple of our web servers that we've got in Nova already. Um, let's us select things really quickly. Uh, and then we will create a very basic monitor, um, just a little HTTP monitor here that'll check for status code 200. So once we click create, um, we'll go ahead and send the API requests. Um, our load balancer will be in pending create status. Uh, it'll be offline until it's fully created. Uh, and then you can just, you know, check this page again until the load balancer is up and running. So I don't think there's anything else to this demo. Oh, here we oh. go. We're refreshing it. Yep, and now it's online and active. So uh, you can, from here, you can do some of the more complicated stuff like add more listeners to it, et cetera. The initial create workflow just has the one listener because it's just trying to get things up and running quickly. <coughs> so do uh, some quick notes about session persistence. Uh, if you're not familiar with session persistence, um, basically it allows us to keep requests uh, going to the same server for the same user in case you have like some sort of state that you're maintaining inside your application. Uh, so without pre session persistence, what happens when you go to a website like openstack.org is your request will go in. It'll go through the load balancer, be sent to a server, return to you, uh, and then if you make the same request again as the same user, or let's say go to the news um, site, it might send you to a second server uh, because it doesn't have any sort of state tracking built in. Uh, so if we enable session persistence, uh, there's a few methods to do this, but um, HTTP cookie is a really easy one. So if we enable session persistence, it will be somewhat intelligent about things. It'll send the user to a server that it picks the, for the first request. Um, and then for subsequent requests, it will attempt to send the user to the same server. Obviously, if that server goes down, it will redirect them to another one. But if it can, it will send the user to the same server. Uh, the other interesting thing that we can do with load balancing in OpenStack is we can do TLS termination at the load balancer. So this makes the load balancer actually decrypt the request um, when it goes to the, uh, before it goes to the backend server and then re-encrypt um, when it's returning the response to the user. Uh, so this has the, the benefit of all of your backend servers don't have to handle all the heavy lifting of decrypting your TLS requests. Um, all of that is handled by the load balancer. And uh, if your load balancers have special like hardware to do that, you can decrypt way more requests that way um, very quickly. Uh, it also cer simplifies certificate management because certs only need to be installed and updated on the load balancer. You don't have to maintain all of your certificates on every app server in your fleet. Um, and they're stored, they can be stored in a secure location. So Octavia um, uses, and Neutron LBAS uses uh, the Barbican project to store our certificates. So the user will actually put their certificates uh, and their private key in Barbican, which uses a secure storage mechanism, uh, and then just pass the ID reference to the load balancing so we can go fetch it from there. Um, so when we, when we handle it, it's all over HTTPS. We throw it away when we're done with it. Um, and on the load balancing servers, uh, it's kept 
in memory or um, in the case of Octavia or uh, stored however, however hopefully securely uh, the third party vendor does that. Um, it also allows for some advanced load balancing of TLS requests uh, like header uh, inspection and injection. Um, Gurman, did you yeah, have notes about that? that? There's an important thing. So, so when we had on the case where we didn't encrypt uh, HTTP requests on the load balancer, and the HTTP protocol allows a client to specify a timeout, and then when you go and, sp and the client specifies a timeout, which is longer than the timeout you have set globally on the load balancer, then the load balancer will prematurely cut a connection and it will be very bad experience on the client. So when you do HTTPS termination on the load balancer, it can pass the HTTP headers, see that somebody requests a longer timeout and then implement that on the load balancer and make sure that it doesn't cut a connection prematurely. So that's uh, it's usually best practice to kind of terminate a load balancer so it can do the timeouts and read all those other things which are in the header and do something smart about it. But um, if you don't do that, be mindful that you might end up with prematurely uh, disconnected things if you don't choose your timeouts wisely on the load balancer. Yeah, the, definitely that. Um, I know also it's useful to be able to inject headers like uh, it exported for or exported port so your application knows where the request is coming from because otherwise that gets uh, masked in this process. Um, the only other thing I would note about this is we don't do re encryption to the back end yet. Um, so, what that means, and we'll see in this uh, little demo, is that when your request uh, comes into the load balancer, it's encrypted. Um, but then when it goes to the back end member, it's decrypted. So this is fine if you're on like a private tenant network, um, if you're confident of your local network security. Um, but if you're not, uh, it would be good to push for us to implement re-encryption because mm. I know we're looking to do that. So um, yeah. we're also, I don't know how many of you guys are uh, upstream contributors, but we're always looking for, mm. for help on some of this stuff. So. Mm. Um, Let's see. So the last thing I want to talk about, I think, is uh, layer 7 load balancing. So if you're familiar with the OSI model, um, layer 7 is just the application layer. Mostly, most of our load balancing happens at layer 4, um, but you can do some interesting things at the application layer. So we have two objects that are relevant for this in OpenStack. Um, we have the policy, which is describing what you want to do, and then the rule, which describes when you want to do it. So an L7 policy could be like, I want to reject all traffic, or I want to redirect traffic to this URL, or I want to redirect traffic to this pool of members. Um, and then the rule could be like, uh, if the host name is ABC, or if the URL path is slash images, or if the file type is exe, um, or any of these things starts with, ends with, contains. So for example, I could say reject all traffic where the file name ends with exe. Just, I know I don't serve executable files, let's not take a chance, let's just block possible malware attacks. Um, you can also do things like uh, redirect to URL is useful if you wanted to redirect all your traffic from HTTP to HTTPS. So you can actually put in a policy that says redirect to URL HTTPS colon slash slash URIP um, and do that always and it, or on uh, I think path slash is how we do that so that captures every request mm -hmm. and that way if a user goes into your website unsecure it'll automatically redirect them to the secure site. Mm -hmm. So just uh, an example of how, what things look like in this case. So I know we had our, our load balancer here. Um, and listeners and pools, and you've seen that before. Uh, German showed you that part. What we have now is on our uh, our listener port 443. We have an L7 policy, um, and I guess we're saying redirect to a different pool. Um, and then we have some rule. We didn't define what this rule is, but um, what this is going to do is if it matches the rule, uh, it's going to instead of forwarding traffic to you, the default pool there, the, the one with our two members, it will forward traffic to an additional pool with this one member. Um, so just in case you have like two apps running on under the same IP um, and they're like separated by different addresses, you could run them both 
on the same load balancer and just split them off with this rule. So, um, and so like I said earlier, we love when people get involved, um, whether that be contributing code or just giving us comments because we love to hear what users actually are looking for. Um, we don't like to operate like in behind the scenes in a, inside of a black box or something. We, we want to hear what you guys have to say. So if you have um, suggestions, if you have bugs that you've run into, by all means, um, come report those to us, uh, talk yeah. to us, give Box us feedback. Launch pad, yeah, 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 yeah. For bugs, launchpad slash Octavia um, mm -hmm. is just file bugs there. Uh, we really do like to see stuff show up there because um, if, we, if we don't fix stuff, you know, it, it's just as hard on us when we have to uh, track this stuff down by hand because we're going to run into it eventually, hopefully. Um, but any reports you can give us are, are great. Um, and yeah, definitely get involved. We have weekly meetings on IRC. Um, we're always around on our IRC channel. Um, yeah, I'm RM Work. Uh, this is X German. Yeah. And, uh, and our yeah, fearless we, leader is Johnson. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> Michael Johnson, uh, uh, the PTL, <laughs> is Johnson. He wasn't able, again, to make it today, but um, he's on there as well. Uh, oh. So thank you very much for coming. Um, questions? Yeah, do you have any questions? Because that we think that's probably the most valuable thing here is if we can get your questions answered. Okay. I'll, I'll run around in. The, the microphone, oh, please. Is there? Cool, so awesome. Since, yeah, we are recording this session, so it would be very good. Awesome, you don't have to run around like I did last time. No. Um, as far as I know, it's uh, uh, still possible to use uh, uh, LB -A -A -S, uh, as with the agent only. So I would like to know if this deprecation of the HA proxy namespace driver is it for Octavia only or for both projects? So uh, Octavia um, right now is in the process of adding the uh, existing drivers under it. So there's another talk actually. Do we? Put the slide on. Uh, we didn't do the talk. Okay, like, we don't but, have the but other anyways, talk. Slide, but so, there's so another talk where we're going to talk very in depth about that tomorrow, um, about exactly what's going on with Octavia versus Neutron Elbas. Right now, Neutron Elbas, um, not Octavia, has the the namespace driver uh, running under it. Octavia does not yet. Um, Octavia will, uh, as of I think Queens is our target, uh, support third-party drivers under yes. it, but for now that's all still under Neutron and, and we have And we understand a lot of people are still using the namespace driver, so, so, there's, so, so there's a plan to maybe move it in its own repository so the community can take care of it. Because as we said, we, yeah, we, we don't think people really need a non-scalable, non-HA uh, uh, driver, but it's very useful for testing. So we're well, thinking yeah. about porting it over, yeah. You can implement uh, HA with H, uh, HA proxy as well, but okay. This you, is a yeah, I, I know you can. Yeah, and we're actually using HA proxy in our HA solution, yes. which is Octavia. It's just the namespace driver itself is not a uh, great implementation of that. Okay, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, this was my second question because I was asking, uh, was uh, wanting to ask which features depend on Octavia and which are with the uh, yeah just the agent, but. So now wait till tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sure. Any other questions? <laughs> okay, I guess then uh, thank you everybody for coming. Please get involved and yeah, thanks. Yeah.